Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Billy Alcoholic. Good to be here. My home group's the Tell It Like It Is group. We meet Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday at the Oasis Club. It's a men's uh, group. So it's really good to be here. I know everybody wants to get out of here. Uh, I'm a Jets fan, which makes spirituality on a Sunday usually very difficult. Uh, I've been up praying in contact with my higher power, uh, which is every Sunday routine in the fall. Um, I want to thank the committee, the other speakers, especially the speakers that you know, we're asked last minute to stand in. Um, I really want to thank the committee. I heard some of the comments made. Um, you know, AA is a interesting, odd, funny place. I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, my sympathy goes out to anyone who does any kind of service in AA, including putting on something like this, because the way it goes is, you know, last week, like last Sunday... When you are looking forward to putting on this event, you know that you have been busting your ass for 360-something days. You know all the last-minute phone calls that are coming in, all the people who have had ridiculous, apparently amazing spiritual experiences, but they cannot read a flyer, they cannot observe a deadline, they cannot read when to register by... And most of all, what you know is that there is a whole group of people who are going to show up who have not done a thing for the last year, but they have their list of what you could have done better. That is a fact in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I am extremely thankful to the committee. Um, You know, Cliff talked about life preservers. I was guilty. I felt guilty. I felt less than... um, Because my arrogance, like he actually said, I grabbed the life preserver and it was the wrong color. I am so arrogant that when the helicopter from the Coast Guard is flying above me, I want to know if the person throwing it before they even throw it is cool enough to help me. Like, do they think Thurman Munson is the greatest catcher of all time? Do they believe Jimmy Page is the greatest guitarist that ever lived? Like, is that person who's going to throw me this life-saving message cool enough? Like, that's the arrogance level. And then he talked about self-direction. And I don't know what it was about this past May or April or whatever he was talking about, but I had a similar, let's just call it crisis. And self-direction is tough. Really, really hard. The earliest speakers were so good. Because I know... You know, I've been hearing you can act yourself into right thinking my whole life. Billy, just change your actions. Just take the next right action. And apparently, you know, my story is over and over the same, which is, okay, God steers, I row, I got it. I'm a rower. But apparently, based on the evidence of repeated failures... Uh, I eventually get tired of rowing. I do. Rowing gets boring. It's not even that I'm tired of rowing. I'm bored of rowing. Boredom has caused more problems in my life than t- than being tired. And I don't know who else here got sober young. I know a few people. I heard a couple of people speak. But I don't know. You people talked about serenity, but that seemed boredom to me. Like, I didn't know the words were different, but... My problem with rowing that boat is eventually I cannot help myself and I will turn around and I will say to God, hey, how about letting me steer this for a little while? What do you think? A little tired of rowing. Just a little tired of rowing. It's a little boring. Let me steer for a little while. And I just want to report, if you're new in AA or haven't been around here that long, that... uh, my answer has been the same from God the whole time. That God is gracious. 
and always says, of course, Billy, you can steer. But God doesn't row. Just understand that. Like, I'll let you steer, but I don't row. It's not my job. And your job's not steering. But I get confused with that a lot. I really want to thank Jeff last night. I know you heard some references to stepping stones and other things, so I told them to put a picture up quickly, take me off the screen for a second, because I just want to make a quick comment before I move on. I know that some people go to Dr. Bob's house, that's their Shangri-La. I know some people go up to Bill's house in Vermont, and that's their ultimate, you know, spiritual oasis. Other people go to stepping stones wherever you go, but to me, that is the place to go in New York City. Okay, that still exists today. That, you might get box 459 in the mail from GSO. It might not. It might look like a nice little label. But you see, that mailbox, that's the actual mailbox. That is P.O. Box 459, Grand Central Station, New York, New York. So, the next time you're in New York, the next time you're walking, if you're not from here, I'll just give you some easy kind of nuances to remember, even goes east on streets, not avenues, okay? There's only one street that actually breaks that rule. It's right by Lincoln Center because of sometimes the president exiting, but for most of the time, even goes east in New York City, okay? Avenues go down as you're walking east. So if you're walking towards Grand Central Station and you just happen to be a tourist, and you get down and you pass Grand Central and you get to Lexington Avenue, you make a left-hand turn. You go north, how do you know you're going north? The numbers are going to go up. And when you go halfway down the street on the left-hand side, you will see a small, small post office. It says Grand Central Station Annex. When you walk in that door and you turn right, you will see that. That's it. That's the real one. That's where thousands upon thousands upon thousands of letters from people dying of alcoholism all around the world have sent a simple letter asking for help. Now, it's, I don't want to be controversial, but I mean, what have we been doing here all weekend? I mean, I went to Tom I's memorial service a couple of weeks ago and Anyone that ever heard him speak, you know that he said all the time, when God has work to do, the walls come down. That might have been his second most famous thing saying from the podium, when God has work to do, the walls come down. But his most famous thing of saying is probably a little controversial in today's world. It's you have a decision to make when you're carrying this message. Are you going to be effective or not? There is nothing wrong with wanting to be effective. And don't confuse activity with action. You know, Tom said that over and over and over again, and that doesn't mean that everything has to be like a Taliban rigid, you know, highlighter exercise in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about the grace of God. I'm talking about Sometimes you just don't know what's going to take somebody else's heart and bring them in. It's easy to get someone, easier to get someone, by the way, the statistics prove, it's easier to get someone to their first AA meeting than back to their second. I just want to let everyone know that, why Tom I was so concerned about being effective. It is super easier to get someone to their first meeting than back to their second. You know, and what Jeff talked about, you know, I know there's some new people here. The outside world doesn't understand our illness. And by the way, next 59 minute is in debating society neutral zone. So whether you like illness, spiritual malady, whatever you choose, I'm not getting in the debating society the next hour. In the hospitality room, I'll debate it all night long, not debating it. Um, but, you know, they don't understand I moved, I bought a new house last year, and I changed doctors, and just want to let you know that, you know, when we talk about practicing the 12th step, and, you know, I have three parts, you know, 
to go over today. I mean, really, the 12th step should, I sometimes think Bill was wrong. He should have written it like the end of how it works, the three pertinent ideas, because there's an A, B, and a C in the 12th step. You know, there really is. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps, A, carrying the message, B, practicing his principles in all affairs, C, but they don't all look the same, and carrying the message can look different, but I went to this new doctor, and I filled out all the forms, and, you know, it said, how often do you drink? I love that question. <laughs> do you drink two drinks a week, seven drinks a week, ten drinks a week, more than ten? And, you know, right away when you look at that question, you're like, they think more than ten is a problem, which is crazy to me. Like, ten is less than two a day. And they have that as the worst, like more than ten a week. Um, but I checked, I circled zero. And because people like John Q, who's not here, and a lot of other good people who went before me have taught me, like I have a job to do in that doctor's office. I wrote right next to the question, even though there wasn't a line. I circled zero, and I wrote sober since my sobriety date, and I wrote it. And now I was referred to this doctor. She's a top doctor where I live. I had the right insurance to get in and see her. My insurance didn't even cover it all. She is apparently the top doctor around by me. And so at the end, she interviewed me. And she said, oh... Sober since? I said, yes. And she said, not even one? <laughs> and I said, no. She said, nothing at all? And I said, no. I said, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a recovered alcoholic, but I'm an alcoholic. And, you know, I spent an extra probably 30 minutes there quickly telling her, what it's like to be a 14-year-old boy who a judge sends to AA. What it's like to be in and out of AA for nine years until you're 23 years old. And I say that as another example of the world just doesn't understand our illness. And, you know, I'm not saying to be the poster child out there breaking your anonymity. I'm just saying there are places and people you're going to come into contact with and you will be the only copy of this book that they ever meet, never run into. You know, and and it's so important. You know, when we were talking about amends this weekend, you know, you ever in a meeting, you know, I'm sure you are, you know, and we listen. I have my, Cliff was calling me out, like I have my list of, you know, worst things in my head, you know. You ever in an amends meeting and somebody says, oh, I needed to make myself first on that list. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you just screwed over the whole world. You tore apart your whole family. You have devastated everybody you came into contact with. And you're selfish and self-centered, but are going to make you number one on your amends list? Like, But I've learned to not say that anymore, right? You, just, you don't say it anymore, right? But that doesn't mean I don't think it sometimes. However... You ever in another meeting, and we all have heard these, the amends that are supposed to go really bad, but go good? And sometimes we confuse that, that that might be the greatest evidence of God's power in our lives. But I would tell you, when you're around here a little while, the amends that go bad are probably a greater demonstration of God's power. Because what happens with that amends? And I don't know everybody here's personal stories. And I don't know who your worst amends was. And I don't know who the person that still can't stand you the most in life is. But the truth is, they don't all go great. But even the person that despises you the most, even the person that can't forgive you, even the person that can never forget what you've done. When they leave wherever that table was, wherever that park was, wherever that Starbucks was, wherever it was, the one thing they know for the rest of their life 
is that Alcoholics Anonymous is so powerful, it made a piece of trash like me make amends. Now, I'm not, if there's any psychologist in the world, I'm beyond thinking I'm a piece of trash myself. I've gotten beyond that point. I have a therapist. I've, you know, listen, I'm, you know, but they might still think you're a piece of trash. But they also know that AA is so powerful. And you see, that's God's grace because that person will have somebody in their life that needs us. And they will think, wow, even that person I can't stand, that horrible alcoholic, AA got them better. Like the power of God is weaved all throughout what we've heard all weekend. You know, I'm a simple person. I believe the steps are our message. I don't believe we have another message. I believe the steps are like a ruler, like our message, like we know a lot about a very little. That's it. That's the only message we have. We're not a trauma surviving program. We're not, we, we are, we, we, the steps are our message. And I believe the traditions protect our message. And I believe the concepts perpetuate our message. You know, some people here know this story, but if you haven't heard it, I'm just going to let you know it so that you can remember more about AA than me. I don't even care if you hated all the speakers this weekend or only liked a few of them or it's your choice. But don't confuse anybody this weekend with the organization. So if you don't know this story, I'm going to pass it on to you because I happen to know it. That in 1998, how powerful is this 12-step of ours? All 12 steps culminating in the 12th step. But just how powerful is this thing we call this, as Bill said, a spiritual society of alcoholics in action? Well, in 1998, Time Magazine knew two things were going to happen in two years. They knew it in two years. They knew Time Magazine would turn 80 years old. And they also knew there would be a new century. The 20th century would end and the 21st century would start. As a result, now, I love all these pictures, and I have great admiration and respect for AA historians and archivists. But Time Magazine, they uh, established a committee of the smartest historians in the world. Not like the runoff guy who collects big books. You know that person. We all have one in our town. No, no. They went to the greatest universities in the world and found the smartest historians in the world and they established their little 20-person committee. And so they paid that committee to meet for a couple of months. And they gave them one question, based on the whole Time magazine being 80 years old and the new century. They said, start on January the 1st of 1900 and end on whatever date it is that it is today. And we need you to identify the 80 most important days of the 20th century. What are the 80 most important days of the 20th century? Now, you can, you can multiply 365 by 98 or 99. You know that's a big number. It's a lot of days in a century. Now, it's the only kind of halfway anonymous, not anonymous book I have in the public section of my house. Um, but you can leave here today and you can Google or you can eBay, whatever, and just put it in. 80 Days to Change the World by Time Magazine. Order yourself a copy. And then when it gets in to you in the mail, just be prepared. Be prepared for however you feel when you know that God has graced you more than anyone else. Because when you get about 15 pages into that book written by the smartest 20 historians in the world, and you get into the section on the 1930s, you will land on June 10th, 1935. You will land on a page that says, on this day, a broken stockbroker from New York met a broken surgeon from Akron. And from that meeting led to the birth of Alcoholics Anonymous, which has saved millions of lives and has also shared their solution with people who suffer from other problems. 
You know, and to me, if any of you used to listen to a lot of tapes, I'm a big Peg M fan from Nebraska, and she doesn't get to travel as much anymore, but she always talked about, you know, our forgetter. And not to forget her that we're alcoholic, but just to forget her that what saved my life. Especially I so, you know, identify with people who get sober young. It's easy to drive down the Garden State Parkway and leave your office late on a Friday. And for those who just came into town on a Friday or a Thursday, I'm just letting you know, uh, that was nothing. If you really want the real deal, just come like two weeks after Memorial Day or July 4th. And get on the turnpike after 2 o'clock, sometimes afternoon, and be on the four-hour adventure, okay? And it is easy before you even get to the Raritan Bridge, it is easy before you even get to Sayerville to think to myself, I want to golf more. I want to go to more concerts. I want to do a million things more. But what's the very thing that gets in the way of my life? This crazy, stupid thing called AA. It seems to always interfere with my life. And Peg M used to always say, how spiritually sick are we? That the very thing that saved our life is the thing that we want to cut back, is the thing we want to stop doing. And by the way, I am not talking about cutting back or adding meetings. I'm talking about the whole business of being a recovered member of Alcoholics Anonymous. But, you know, as I was saying, it's not always a highlighter. You know. Uh, Right before COVID, about six months before, um, you know, I look at Alcoholics Anonymous, I said this yesterday, you know, and I love the reference to when at church. It's one of my favorites. We're like the island of misfit toys in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, okay? We sometimes convince ourselves how spiritually over the top we are. But as I heard somebody say a lot smarter than me, at our best, we're weak, frail human beings prone to do things that shame us. We are the broken jack-in-the-box. We are the broken yo-yo. We are all the people that end up broken, so broken. And if you're new, welcome, because, see, that's the great thing. We love new people. And we honor your brokenness until we can judge you. But enjoy while you're in the period of being broken. Because <laughs> we love broken people. But you know, that picture I put up of Box 459, uh, six months before COVID, I went with Wallace. If you don't know Wallace, if you're ever in North Carolina, go meet Wallace. Tom I, 12-step Wallace in Central Prison in 1964 or 63. Wallace was sentenced to three life terms plus 30 years in the early 60s. The governor of North Carolina let him out in 1987. Wallace is still sober, 60-something years, whatever. You know, he's, he's just one of my favorite people in all of Alcoholics Anonymous. But Wallace and I received an invitation. We had both been sober and inmates and... We got to go to Angola. If you've never been to Angola, it's a hell on, hell hole on earth. Okay? It's in Louisiana. It's on a peninsula in the middle of a swamp, surrounded on three sides by alligators and swamps. And the property is as big as Manhattan. And it's building after building after building of warehousing people, incarcerated men and women. And, um, they thought they didn't know that they would be able to get us on death row. We knew there were two AA members. 73 men and women on that day that we visited were currently ex sentenced to execution. Um, and as it turned out, you know, AA, miracle after miracle after miracle. There was a federal judge with us. He's a good friend of mine. He used to be a non-alcoholic trustee. Anyway, we got cleared to go to death row, Wallace and I. And, um, you know, it was quite an experience to be driven on a bus all the way to the end of, like, this hellhole in a swamp to a sign that just said, literally, Death House. That's what it said. I could send you the picture. Death House. And then inside this prison facility that we were already in, we then went through other 
uh, electric gates and barbed wire. And, you know, we were there with a corrections volunteer and, you know, that's their house. They don't want to talk. They don't have to talk. They don't feel like talking to someone outside from AA today. They don't have to talk to someone outside from AA. But I just want to tell you that approaching new people, this is an affair of the heart. This is God's grace that has a lot to do with it. James is a friend of mine today. He is still on death row. James was one of the two AA members. When we went into this building, which, by the way, it's October or November. It's like 100 degrees outside. There's no air conditioning in the death house. It's... I feel like I'm in a prison in Game of Thrones, like not in USA. Yeah, I'm not, you know, like, I don't feel like I'm in today's world. I feel like this building that I'm in is bar whatever. But anyway, James didn't feel like talking too much. And as I was walking past James's cell, what did I see? But I saw a sports magazine open to a certain page. And I just said to him, I said, Please don't tell me you're a long-suffering Knicks fan like I am. And he just lit up. He said, I don't know what's worse, being on death row or being a Knicks fan. <laughs> and what I tell you about that is that James and I talked for like the next 40 minutes. And... um they're one of the facilities that use current technology where you can write to inmates. So James and I are able to communicate um, electronically. Um, but I just say that because, you know, you never know. You just never know. Some of you might know a woman. Her name is Suzanne. She's very active in service in, Bo in the Boston area. I've heard her tell a story many times. But... It's amazing what keeps people in AA. She's sober over 40 years, I think. She came in when she was like 18 or 19, 20, something young. And she was having a hard time in AA, a really hard time that young. You know what? You know what, like, kept her in, really in? She was having a bad night and went to a meeting. And she walked into this meeting and she had known that there was this biker guy that always went to this meeting who she was kind of scared of, she said. And she said that night, for whatever reason, when she walked into the meeting, she had never even talked to him before. He was a greeter that night. And he just looked at her and said, you know, it's going to be okay. That's all he said. She never had another interaction with him in her entire AA life. That was it. When I heard last night's speaker, that's all her interaction with that guy was. This big, kind of tough-looking biker who she never talked to, who was greeting, standing at the front door, who just said, you know what? You're going to be okay. And for whatever reason, she went home that night, and she believed it. She believed she was going to be okay. Now, the speakers this weekend have been so great, and they all had a lot of common themes, but one of them is definitely, and I've heard it said before, God has rigged the game. The giver gets it all. Like, that's the deal. God has rigged it. The giver does get it all. And, you know, I had to learn a long time ago when I heard people talking the first step this weekend on till the last 11th step, there are really two kinds of people in the world. There are people who can drink and those who cannot. The quicker you find out which one you are, the better. The quicker. It's very simple. It's, it's the beauty of our great traditions. We don't care if you're black, and we don't care if you're white, and we don't care if you believe in God or don't believe in God. We don't care if you're gay or straight, trans. We don't care about anything. The beauty of the great third tradition, written a hundred years before diversity and inclusion became daily words in our world we live in is that we don't care. Or if I can quote Metallica, nothing else matters. 
Nothing else matters. Are you a person who can drink? Or are you a person who can't drink? And if you don't know which one you are, and you've wound up in AA, you might want to find. Because you're going to hear certain things that don't sound great. Like change your attitude or change your sobriety date, you make the choice. I didn't like hearing that. That sounds kind of horrible, actually. I mean, I'm just saying. But, you know, I don't know why Jimmy asked me to, because the 12th step, you know, again, we can go to what all we hear in meetings. That's a tall order. Having had a spiritual experience. Not as a result of going to church. As a result of these steps. That means you have to have had a spiritual experience. The way I read it. Which, what do you do if you're somebody like me that showed up here a diehard atheist? A diehard atheist. And not one of those people that were popular at the time. I'm sure there's some people here who came into AA in the um, 80s or 90s. Very in chic at that time to either be my inner child is kicking my ass or I'm a recovering Catholic or all these things that have nothing to do with sobriety, right? All these things that you hear. But I was not an atheist because I did not believe, because my parents' religion harmed me. Not at all. I was an atheist. And again, by the way, I just want to set, I usually have to make a few disclaimers. So I'll take care of the atheist one first. If you're an atheist and you're sitting here, I have the greatest respect for you in the world. The greatest. I don't care what you are or what you believe in. I'm here to transmit my personal story. That's it. You have as much right to be an Alcoholics Anonymous or more than I do. If you're a social worker, I may say something in the next half hour that could bother you. So, I want you to know that I love social workers. They have a great work to do in today's world. But I'm a 14-year-old boy who got sent to AA. I'm 56 years old. I've never been invited to a meeting with a social worker where I get good news, ever. Ever. If there is a social worker in a meeting with me, I am about to be told something that I am not going to like hearing at all. And then I know there's some Al-Anons here. And Lori was awesome. And I'm the product of an Al-Anon mother. You know, an Al-Anon mother. If there's any reason to grab a hold of the book that a lot of people have referred to this weekend, it is simply to know what AA is and what AA isn't. It is simply for someone to help transmit a message to you. And I'm going to get into that. But you're going to hear things in AA that doesn't apply to everybody. You are. You ever hear someone say, I'll just give you my worst one first. They say, ah, oh, my worst day sober is better than my best day drinking. Really? Who did you drink with? What do you, what is the kind of partying that you're into? Because that is not my story. Did you take it from that page in the big book that says I wouldn't trade the life of today for yesteryear? Well, I could, I could go with that. I'm not trading my life away. But are you asking me if checking into a correctional facility at four and a half months sober was better than the first day of spring break Fort Lauderdale, 1988? No way! No way! I know which day was better. But if you're new, you may hear things like that. You just will. I mean, it's... There's a lot of things you can hear in meetings. And of course, because, listen, I don't think there's a difference even in age of alcoholism. But I have a particular niche of people that I tend to work with, and they tend to be 16 to 25-year-old young male punks. That's just it. That's it. That's who's waiting in the parking lot when I come out of Oasis. I'm minding my own business, and they're right there. In fact, I was laughing when Cliff was talking because one of the recent things one of them showed to me, oh, Billy, you got to see this new 10-step app. 
And so I look at it and I'm like, uh, that's the 11 step. I don't know who made this app or what book they're reading, but they seem to have the nightly review very confused with inventory. But what am I going to do? Keep my mouth shut? It's a young kid who needs help. And, you know, most young kids that I run into, our alcoholism is the same. But there is one difference I've noticed about chronologic age, chronologic age. And that is they show up like with me, like with absolutely no foundation in life. Zero. They do not have what some of my 50 and 60 year old friends who made it until they were 40 or 50, they seem to have some kind of map. Even drinking. Uh, most of the people that I meet and myself did not have that. Because I hear people say there's nothing worse than a belly full of booze and a head full of AA. Not my story. My story, nothing worse than a belly full of booze and my mother's head full of al -Anon. That is a much, much, much painful combination. When you are a 14-year-old chronic alcoholic and your mother goes to Al-Anon because of your dad, it is deadly to the household. Deadly. And I don't know what message they practice in Step 12, but I can give you the version as a teenager. You know, and I buried my mother um, in 2000. And so I know what it's like to sit with her um, in, a ho in a hospice. And um, Christmas Day, 1999, I showed up with her wig her makeup, her crazy Charlie perfume, if you remember those old commercials. A couple of crazy CDs of her favorite Irish music and a small boom box and Polaroids of her cat. And I visited her in that hospice in the Bronx. And, um, you know, at one point, you see, we don't realize the kind of wreckage that we produce. And really what I've learned a lot is most of the wreckage that we think is our top wreckage, when you really get to talk to people whose lives we've harmed, there's a lot of things we forget that they've made a lot more important than us because our egos are so out of control. But my mother, at one point, I stopped. I, my Dunkin' Donuts cup is gone, but that morning I stopped at Dunkin' Donuts. I got two large coffees. I showed up at her hospice, cranked up the back of her bed, jumped up, threw down two Dunkin' Donuts coffees like, like we were drinking two tall boys. No, I love, I love hospices. They're not like hospitals. You know, like you can order whatever you want. There's no like bland diet. Like they treat people dying with so much dignity and respect. But if you've ever dealt with someone that's in that stage of their life, which my mother was, they sometimes go in and out of consciousness or they hallucinate. And at one point that day, my mother looked at me and said, Billy, don't ever leave AA. AA gave me the ability to go get a quart of milk. Now that sounds like a pretty crazy statement when you're sitting there drinking coffee with your mother. Like what the hell does AA have to do with a quart of milk? But you see... I'm a teenage disaster. I don't know what it's like to be my parent. But my mother explained to me what it's like to be an Al-Anon. She explained to me that at a period of her life, if she ran out of something at night inside the house, she would do without until the next day because if she went to the store at night when the stores weren't crowded, she might run into somebody she knows. And if she runs into somebody she knows, they might ask her the hardest question that anyone could ask her in her daily life, which is a very simple question of, how are your children? She couldn't deal to hear that question. She couldn't. She couldn't be alone. And she told me in that hospice that at some point in her journey in Al-Anon and my journey in AA, and she would not know yet that she had another son who would end up in AA. She couldn't wait to go to the store at night when it was empty. 
She couldn't wait for somebody to walk up to her and ask her how her children were. She couldn't wait to shout from the rooftops the miracles of Al-Anon family groups and Alateen and Alcoholics Anonymous and what it had done for their family. She just couldn't wait. And, you know, how would I know, as such a young boy that came here, that I had such a distorted relationship with alcohol? Not only do I have, you know, a reaction that's not normal, an abnormal reaction, I have an abnormal relationship with alcohol. So I don't know about any of you, but I'll just lay my cards on the table. It doesn't make me sound good. I was 40, I want to repeat that, 40 years old and 17 years sober when I found out that the rest of the world thinks drinking one six-pack is too much in one night. I don't know when you knew that. I found out when I was 40 from working in the adult work world all those years. And you know what, because when I was a senior in high school, I had to see the school psychologist every week for an hour, one hour. I was a rule as the way I stayed in school. And Dr. Pavi was a great guy. And do you know, at 17 years old, my relationship was so odd and crazy with alcohol that I looked at him once and I said, you know, Dr. Pavi, I'm just going to have a six-pack on Friday night and a six-pack on Saturday night. And I thought like I was the greatest guy in the world. I thought like I was really going over the top trying to get on the plan that they wanted me on. And yet I would be 40 years old and 17 years sober and learn that the rest of the world. And then you know what I learned? Because hopefully my career will come to an end. I want it over. But I've had a great, great career. A an amazing career. And I came here with nothing. But I'll get to the resentment I discovered. You know, I'm the kid who got the third highest score on the SATs. And I'm not bragging to let you know that. Because there's a lot worse that comes with that. <laughs> but I got the third highest score on the SATs. And I went straight from being at a party all night drinking. But I had to go to summer school to finish high school. Like, how is that possible? You know, how does that happen? And my resentment against those kids who did everything in the same amount. Like, it's only in the recent, and I'll get to it a little bit, have I really come to terms with that resentment. Like, how resentful have I been? You know, if you see me in the work life, if you're the person who cleans the office, or if you're the person who brings our mail or whatever, like, I couldn't be more respectful. But if you're like one of those kids who went to four years of college and graduated and went to grad school right away and you've had this perfect life, you don't want to be in a meeting with me. Because I've been on a 20-year mission to show you how much better I am than you, and I wound up homeless and incarcerated. And what a, what a relief it has been to, in the last year, come to terms with that resentment that I didn't even know I carried, you know? I was showing someone my phone earlier today, you know, and I have an everyday anniversary reminder. Every day. Because I have, I have a busy job. I look at my life every morning, and it just says, don't be a dick. Every day. In my calendar. That's what it says right there. It says right there. That's what it says. And some days I'm good at it, and some days I'm bad at it, but I need that reminder. Because I can tell you, you know, when you talk about practicing these principles and all our prayers, like, I can be out to dinner with a waiter or a waitress or lunch somewhere. I travel a lot for work. I'll know if somebody's, like, maybe you know this. Like, I went to the store the other day when I first got here. I went to the supermarket. So we have some magic powers in AA that other people don't have. Some people see people riding a bicycle and they just think it's exercise, but we know the DWI bicycler, right? We know, right? We know, we intuitively, we just look and we know it's not really the exercise. They're like me, right? 
They have no driver's license. They're not getting one back for a while. We just have these powers. Um, you, you learn them as you come here. And, um, you know, I've learned you can tell when people are suffering. You can tell when people are hurting. You know, and so I want to pat myself on the back because, you know, I leave some ridiculously large tip because I could tell the waiter I have, her kids are at home and she probably doesn't have money for the babysitter and whatever else. And But don't be the person who went to Harvard for four years directly after high school and then went to Columbia to get your MBA and got your seven-year start over me in the business world. Because if you're that person, then I'm going to come after you. If you're that person, I'm going to be cutting you down. And really, this has been a lot of growth for me to, like, I heard last night's speaker, who, what am I trying to prove? What am I trying to prove? It gave me the greatest life in the world. But I want to share on a couple of things, you know, in my last 15 minutes to just let you know. Really let you know. So, I'm going to get into my God story. But I heard a big book speaker say a long time ago, at Fellowship of the Spirit, I'm going back old school, Fellowship of the Spirit, St. John's University, mid-90s. And I heard the speaker talk about, like, this story at a dinner table. And I was like, that's yeah, horse, whatever. It's nonsense. That just sounds good at a podium. It's absolutely not true. Well, I'm just going to repeat a story to you if you're new about how other people don't understand our illness. It's true. They don't get it. I don't know how many dinners I've been to around the world for work. A lot. A real lot. Every once in a while, I get to know people kind of well. I might let them know I don't drink. If you're new, I'm just going to give you this little public service announcement. There's a big difference between people knowing you don't drink and knowing why. It's your sponsor's job to figure out which one of the two they are. Do they get to know? Everybody gets to know you don't drink, but not everyone gets to know why. You have to figure that out on your own with your sponsor. But I can tell you 100% of the time this story, 100%. If I tell someone at the dinner table who is a civilian that I got sent to AA at 14 years old, I went to my first AA meeting when I was 14 years old because the judge told me to, I want to reach across the table, I want to put my hand up, and block their mouth, okay? This is 100% of the time because they can't help themselves. They don't know that I have an internal condition that has nothing to do with the outside world. What they want to say is what they all say. They say, God, you must have had a rough childhood. 100% of the time. Their natural reaction is to blame my internal condition on something externally. They just don't get it. And dinner has taught me more at work in the outside world. They don't understand the allergy. I didn't know a lot of people were allergic to shellfish. I've learned that going to dinner for work all over the world. So a lot of people allergic to shellfish. Do you know how many people I've just heard say a simple little thing to the waitress or waiter? Hey, I just want you to know I'm allergic to shellfish. 100% of the time, not one person has had to chime in, God, you must have had a rough childhood. <laughs> Not one. Not one single person. None. And, and better than that, five minutes later, they haven't said, have you had one shellfish? <laughs> they haven't even gone further and said, maybe that was a shellfish phase, you know? Because I know what it's like to be a teenager and a young man and come to Alcoholics Anonymous. But I also know what it's like to be struck. And I'm not going to be ashamed here. I've had a great service journey in Alcoholics Anonymous. Amazing. You know, I currently serve as the treasurer of the board for one of the largest homeless missions in the United States, and I learned how to use Excel on a laptop on a young people's committee in AA. I learned how to use WordPerfect, not even Word, Word Perfect on an old laptop on a young people's committee in AA. Like, 
I put my hand up in the air to be an alternate GSR, GSR in 1993. And five years ago, I put my hand up in the air to elect somebody else to replace me as a trustee and the chair of the AA World Services Board. Uh, I could never repack what AA, repay what AA has given me. But I don't confuse membership with the message, even if it's not popular in the service world today. Membership is membership. Every alcoholic has a right to be a member. That's the long form of the third tradition. Our membership ought to include all those who suffer from alcoholism. But I am not ever going to be ashamed to say that our program of action is about finding a power greater than yourself. I will not confuse that with membership. As much as all that I currently read coming out of certain places seems to say God is a bad word or higher power is a bad word, I don't know. I'm a devout atheist who found God in Alcoholics Anonymous. I am not an atheist, I told you, because I was raised Catholic. I'm an atheist because I thought only stupid people believed in a man in the sky. How arrogant am I? I thought smart people like me, we don't believe in God. That's only the rest of you people. That's what I believed. And yet, I see people who want to confuse membership with the program of action, it just drives me crazy. And so, you know, in my last couple of minutes, I want to talk about what's it like to find God as a result of the 12 steps? How does that happen? I can tell you for me, so I'd met all these people. I'll throw out some names. I met Joe and Charlie in 1993 at the Marriott in New York. They changed my life. I met Joe H. from Santa Monica at St. John's University at Fellowship of the Spirit in the 90s sometime. I think sometimes I'll see, you'll see a set of tapes, the hawk is rising. Um, and you, I can hear him in my head say, recovered! And I loved, you know, when Megan talked, because I could hear him saying, the chant is not, we don't drink no matter what. Joe would always say, the chant is, we drink no matter what. I drink no matter what. I don't have the power to choose over drink. I have the power to decide if I'm going to be a member in my own recovery today. That choice I have. I've lost the power of choice on drink. But I was... In what I would call, maybe if you read certain other authors that all relate back to AA, M. Scott Peck, I could go on and on. They have fancy terms. One of theirs is Dark Night of the Soul. I had no idea what the hell a Dark Night of the Soul was when I came into AA. But I found it. I found a Dark Night of the Soul. Because I thought I was doing everything right. Now, what does that look like when you just met Joe H., and you met Joe and Charlie, and you join a new big book group, and, well, I have a nice highlighted big book. I have that. I have the right notes on the inside covers of my big book. I drew a circle and triangle, like I was told, and I, because they took it out, right? I have everything you're supposed to have. I even have index cards for my amends that are paper clipped by hard, easy, and soft, and then further subdivided by geographic location, like I thought I was doing what I'm supposed to do. But I do not believe in God. One single bit. I believe in science and math. No God. And in the spring of 1995, I was at a meeting, and again, my biker is this woman who I would not even be able to pick out of a lineup. But I was sharing my trouble with spirituality and God in a meeting, and a woman came up to me at the end of the meeting, and she handed me a small piece of paper, and by the way, this is before electronic books, and this is still when you did not go to the self-help section of a Barnes & Noble because you ran into everyone else in AA 
in the self-help section, right? Everyone still went to bookstores, and I don't want to be seen reading the book Getting Sober Without AA, because I want everyone to think I love AA, um, but she gave me the name of a book, and she said, I think you need to read this book based on how you were raised, and so I read it, and it changed my life. I didn't know at the time it changed my life. But a couple of months later, July of 1995, I went to the International Convention in San Diego. So if you're new, let me just tell you, if you're at this convention and you're spending rent money from next summer for this year's convention, it's not unusual in AA. I just want to let you know that everything comes in time. Somehow I made it to that international convention. There was a meeting I wanted to go to in a room like this. There were three people who were going to be in that meeting that I needed to see. One of them I had already met quickly for like 20 minutes, but one of them was Tom I. I'd heard his tape on a Walkman. If you don't know what that is, it's a small rectangular box that you could listen to cassettes on. And I was going from Tom to MC Hammer and back and forth at the time, right? Um, but I knew Tom was going to be in that room. I knew Don P. from Aurora, Colorado was going to be in that room. And I knew Jim Estelle, a non-alcoholic, the head of the Texas prison system, was going to be in that room. And when I walked in the San Diego Convention Center, there was a line, unfortunately, out that room. And there was a fire marshal counting people. And I was, got online. But I was going to get in that room. Now, a little history lesson. There was a bombing about two months before the International Convention in Oklahoma. A very bad one. The guy standing next to me happened to be from Oklahoma. I would love to run into him someday. We started talking. He told me he'd just gotten out of prison last summer. Was a bunch of years sober. Told me that every week he asked his parole officer if he could go to the International Convention of Alcoholics Anonymous in San Diego. And every week his parole officer told him no. And then after the bombing, when things got a little tough in Oklahoma, his parole officer cursed him out, threw him out of the office, and said, only two people can get you there, God or the governor. And so there I am, minding my own atheist business, by the way, not trying to tell other people. I was never one of these people to tell people, don't say the Lord's Prayer. I was just my own atheist business, minding my own business. And what happens? This guy takes a piece of paper out of his back pocket that looks like a report card from when I'm in seventh grade that I haven't shown my parents in four months and has been through the wash like eight times. And he takes out a piece of paper and hands it to me, and I unfold it, and in the right-hand corner is the raised seal of the governor of Oklahoma. And up here it says, and two may concern with his name and his parolee number, and it says, so-and-so may attend the International Convention of Alcoholics Anonymous for 72 hours over July 4th weekend, 1995, and... I left that convention center and my atheist armor took a huge hit. It was like I was in a medieval movie in a suit of armor and somebody took an axe and just crashed into my armor. To the point where I'm almost arguing with a God that I argue with people doesn't exist. <laughs> but I want to let you know if you're new... There's no promise that God is going to come after your third step. There's no promise that God... We don't have the power to schedule your spiritual experience. But if you stay active in Alcoholics Anonymous as a three-legacy member with a home group and a sponsor and active in service and taking people through the book, you will see miracles that you don't even believe in. I left that convention pissed off because I don't believe in God. And so I went to the Oxford group of AA. It meets on Wednesday nights in Manhattan on 84th Street between Columbus and Central Park West. If you happen to know Frank M., the old archivist, that was his home group. I went there minding my own atheist business that night. I had already forgotten about the guy with the letter. My brain can 
Just tell me I'm smart enough. And when I walked into that meeting, uh uh-oh, there's a very elderly kind of classy but elderly lady sitting at the speaker table. Uh Uh-oh, I've never heard her speak before. So I sit down. Wow, she was at the International Convention last weekend too in San Diego. She lives in Tel Aviv, Israel. She's 70-something years old and has a number tattooed across her arm from the camp she was in as a child in Europe. Uh Uh-oh, she was the flag bearer for Israel in the flag ceremony on Friday night. Uh Uh-oh, she was behind the stadium in line with the other people from Jordan and Iran and Saudi Arabia and other places that are not supposed to like each other. And she talked about them all putting down their flags and hugging and crying. And I left there thinking, oh my God, my atheist armor is running out of armor. I better read one of those new atheist books as soon as possible. (laughs) And then I went to the 11 o'clock meeting at the general service office. Minding my own atheist business, I want to remind you, a couple of months later, 11 o'clock on Friday, and the speaker is the corrections chairperson from Ireland. Now, my family has a definite opinion on what goes on in Ireland. Just going to let you know that. I showed Mari yesterday. My grandfather, my grandfather, came here from Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight, where he was detained for many years. I have many family members that have been in what is called the H block or maze. And my family, like, put it this way. When Prince and Charles and Diana got married, somebody took a refrigerator box, probably my dad, and put it around the one TV in our family and wrote on it, that wedding will not be watched in this house, right? Just if you want to know our position. So anyway, the corrections chair of Ireland is there. And he talks about bringing meetings into Mays, into the H block, where there's only two kinds of prisoners, Protestant and Catholic, only prisoners of the Troubles. And where he says to us, no outside organization, including the Red Cross, is allowed in that prison. Never is a Protestant and a Catholic prisoner in the same room. The only violation to that no outside organization and no in the same room is one night a week for one hour. There's a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous where prisoners of both faiths come and all outside issues stay outside. I'm telling you I believe in God because I've witnessed miracles. I have. You know, I'll I'll close with telling you this. I'm a William James fanatic because of the type of believer that I am. I'm a William James fanatic. William James does not get enough credit in AA. Just doesn't. The 12 and 12 tells me that I am the type of destructive drinker that only an act of providence will be. Only an act of providence. AA, seconds and inches. William James, if you don't know this, the second university in this country to give out graduate degrees was Clark in Worcester, Massachusetts. I think you know. I have a hard time giving anything Massachusetts or Boston credit for anything. So this story, believe me, I have to go out of my comfort zone. Freud was the number one psychiatrist in the world. Number one. That doesn't matter to us. But when Clark had this 20-year celebration, they wanted the number one psychiatrist in the world. Freud's number one kind of protege had left, and Freud hired a new protege in the mid-19, early 1905-06. That would be a young doctor named Carl Jung. Freud gets invited to come to America. He gives these lectures. They're world famous, but not important to us. But what is important to us is 
Carl Jung was a diehard Freudian believer when he went to Clark. Diehard. While waiting in the hallway, carrying Freud's books, being his errand boy, he met William James. I know Variety's Religious Experience is a hard book to read, but i got to tell you, it's a book of spiritual experiences. It's a book of things happening that are impossible. And, you know, like I'm a little crazy on this subject, I have talked to the archivist there, I have some books that talk about their interactions. But William James told Young that day, he used the term vital religious experience. If that offends you, like it did me at one point, vital spiritual experience. But William James explained to Carl Jung why he didn't agree with Freud and just said, since the beginning of time, man has been having vital religious experiences. They have done things that are impossible. If you need an example of the kind that William James was telling Young about, like the slave ship captain who wrote the words to Amazing Grace, which most people would consider the most spiritual song ever written, how is it possible that a slave ship captain wrote those words? That's the kind of things James was telling Young about. He said the problem with these spiritual experiences is they're as rare as getting struck by lightning. They don't happen a lot. How does a, how does a sinner become a saint? How does a robber become a priest? How does a self-consumed billionaire start worrying about the rest of the world? He said they're as rare as getting struck by lightning. Now, I don't have a big book in front of me, but I'm sure there's one right down there. That's all the big book is. It's the directions to get struck by lightning if you're a real alcoholic that William James told Carl Young about. That's what it is. You need one of them if you're a real alcoholic. Imagine today, because James died ten months after that meeting with Carl Young. Imagine he never met. But you have the book. What's the book say? The Certain American Businessman, right? who goes to see the number one doctor in Europe. Imagine that certain American businessman met that number one doctor in Europe who had never met William James, who wasn't honest enough to look at that man and say, Roland, science and, ma and, and medicine can't help you. You're hopeless. And him asking Dr. Young, well, have you seen people get better? Yeah, once in a while. Every once in a while, through a vital spiritual experience. And so what do we have today? Somebody put the directions to get struck by lightning if you're an alcoholic in a book for us. That is amazing. You can take the doctor's opinion. You don't have to believe me. I'll date myself. There used to be these things called transparencies. Okay? Long before PowerPoint... You would go to a meeting, and they would have an overhead projector, and it's a whole big thing, right? But um, if you took a transparency of the doctor's opinion and laid it over working with others, you would see the same thing. Because miracles have saved our life. Anybody else here been in a meeting lately? I mean, there's been a lot of AA meetings. I mean, AA movies on TV lately. I don't know if anyone else knows this. My home group, we seem to have like one newcomer every couple of days who is a new expert on AA history who stayed up all night watching My Name is Bill W. on Prime, and now they're going to come teach the rest of us, and they all remember that. And I want to just close with on being effective in honor of Tom I. It, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be an effective carrier of this message. The most famous part of that movie is the Al-Anon part. Bill telling Lois, I can't help anybody. At that point, he's the worst 12-stepper in the history of 12-stepping. He is zero for a couple of hundred. And Lois says, what? 
I don't care. You're sober. But all of us in this room care. See, Dr. Silkworth, when he told Dr. Silkworth that story, he didn't say, oh, that's great, you're still sober. He said, Bill, tell me your approach. Bill told him his approach. I'll steal one of Cliff's words. He said, Bill, that approach sucks. <laughs> that's like the worst thing I've ever heard. You can't tell a drunk that you were in a hospital room at 3 o'clock in the morning and that God blew the window open with the wind and you felt like you were floating on a mountain. And you can't tell a drunk that. You have to stick to the medical estimate of alcoholism. You have to explain this allergy and this mental obsession. But thank God, William James passed on that we have a recipe to get struck by lightning. So, um, you know, I really want to thank the committee for having me here today. I really want to thank Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a brother who is sober as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was at an Area 4 to 4 assembly. I'm not kidding. I had my cell phone on with the New York City police. Oh, no, with him. I had somebody else's cell phone with the New York City police. I'm waiting to hear the police crash through my brother's door because he wants to jump out a window. I know what it's like to meet him handcuffed in Bellevue. I know what it's like to take him to rehab time after time. He's not sober today because of medicine and science. He's sober today because of the grace of God, because of an act of providence. That's what we need. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.